A few years ago, I had the really novel idea that I was going to start a series on this channel where I reviewed bad movies. Totally untapped market, right? Why didn't I run with that? Specifically, it was going to be bad sequels. Either TV movie, direct-to-video stuff, or just otherwise forgotten movies. The inaugural video was going to be about the awful American Psycho sequel, starring Mila Kunis and William Shatner. But as I watched the movie, it became clear that this was just some hack B-movie that got turned into an American Psycho property mid-production, and that pretty pretty much took the wind out of my sails for the whole series. It's a trash movie to be sure, but picking it apart was only fun under the supposed pretense of what the filmmakers were trying to accomplish, a follow-up to a refined, critically acclaimed film. So the fact that they probably were just aspiring for B-movie trash made the whole operation feel a little pointless. They more or less made the movie they wanted to make. American Psycho 2's only real crime was winning the publicity lottery, being written in the right place and at the right time to be drawn out of a hat by executives looking to cash in on their latest hit. That's probably the only reason more than 500 people have seen this movie, but it's also the primary reason for its noxious reputation. Anyway, True Detective Night Country is the latest installment of hit TV show True Detective. Written and directed by Issa Lopez, this marks the first season of the show to not be written by original creator Nick Pizzolatto. This disconnect has kicked up a bit of a shitstorm between Lopez, Pizzolatto, fans of the show, and HBO's upper management. I'm not interested in anyone's behavior here. I sit before you today to talk about the contents of the season itself. Taking place in a remote Alaskan mining town as its long night season begins, a team of researchers mysteriously turns up dead, bearing suspicious connection to a, forgive me, cold case from years prior. Who will solve this mystery? None other than Jodie Foster's chief of police Liz Danvers and Kaylee Reese's recently demoted to state trooper Evangeline Navarro, two equally troubled officers. More than a procedural, this season is about the macro political upheaval within this town, the consequences of its constant mining coming to a head, and pushing the town's residents to finally confront their underlying conflicts, be it their parental and marital troubles, cultural biases and white supremacy, or corruption within the police force. I am brave enough to say that this season is not a complete abomination. For what it's worth, I think it's very well acted despite flimsy material to go off of, particularly in Foster's case. There's a deep corrosion to her every delivery, not so much an impenetrable emotional shield over the things she's repressing, but a tetanal rust that's crusted over everything, weathered by her environment and the events of her life. Small town web of interconnected neighbors is a tried and true setup for the genre, but the remote nature of the fictional Ennis is particularly claustrophobic, and it gives an air of allegory to all the factional con conflicts this season covers, heightened by the liminal quality of the long night itself and the supernatural elements hinted at throughout the season. There are a lot of good ideas that form the identity of this season. So no, it's, it's not an abomination. It's just incredibly mediocre and fails to deliver on basically any of its promises, starting with the case itself. Lopez has cited the Dyatlov Pass incident as an inspiration for this season, a confounding group death in the tundra. What made people cling to the Dyatlov Pass incident was the sheer mystique around what happened, with so many contradictory details to the case. There is a logical explanation for it, by virtue of the fact that it happened. We'll just never know what it actually is, and without confirmation, we naturally run wild with it and confound ourselves and even scare ourselves. And this idea is actually the closest thing I can draw to a through line across the other seasons of True Detective, an unknowable force that our mortal anti-heroes try fruitlessly to make sense of, aware of its cosmic scope. So to her credit, Lopez was clearly engaging in this conversation by drawing from Dyatlov, but she kind of writes herself into a corner. Because when you're making a crime mystery, the confounding factors tend to come with the promise of an explanation. Dyatlov is specifically a staying phenomenon because it doesn't have that, which already slots perfectly into True Detective's reputation of intentionally unsatisfying mysteries. So it's telling that Lopez uses it as a springboard for this story, and then in the show's final minutes offers a totally cut and dry, rational explanation for everything. So I guess in this one instance, the show is actually delivering too much on its promise, when it's following a tradition of not doing so. The consequences is that rather than existential horror and mysticism coming from the core of the story, Lopez has to resort to drawing it from more extraneous, unrelated goings-on in the town and spontaneous 2005-esque horror cutaways. This means the long night itself is also robbed of any mystique. Admittedly, it's a strong atmospheric idea, a lot of room for obfuscation under the extreme weather conditions and pushing people to their most base, animalistic instincts. It seems perfectly teed up for the kind of mysterious, we'll never know what happened 
in the dark of night, ambiguity the show is always fed on. Throughout the season, we get title cards tracking our progress through this night. It seems to suggest some sort of heightened mass delirium festering as the withdrawal symptoms from the sun start to set in, but it pretty much pops that balloon in the very first scene we meet our characters in, with a remark like, Just the third day of dark and it's already getting weird. Maybe it's meant to foreshadow that if this is our baseline, imagine how much worse things are going to get, but they don't really. The weather conditions mainly amount to sheer inconvenience, putting the investigation on pause over and over, and the one time it actually endangers a lead character with Danvers rebirth in the finale, she gets enough plot armor for the cold to not even matter. Ironically, the one time a character does die from the elements, she's found by the Coast Guard within an hour in these supposedly horrendous conditions. If anything, this dark, unseemly atmosphere gives the season an excuse to spend long stretches in the cozy, Christmas decorated indoors, safe from the elements, and safe from any real interrogation of human cruelty and messiness and unknowability. On that note, the season's approach to politics is a little frustratingly simple. For one, it takes a very post-George Floyd brand of ACAB fervor approach to its rhetoric interrogating police corruption, which feels closer to the likes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine than True Detective. No, I'm not saying this is an unwelcome pursuit, by any means, and it certainly feels more warranted in a serious police drama than a sitcom, but it feels like it's very clearly signaling the events of 2020 more than something timeless and universal. Again, nothing wrong with pursuing immediacy and engaging with relevant politics, but when you're this lasered in on events that are coming up on four years ago, it doesn't feel so immediate. I'm not sure I can identify what the difference is, it's possible metatextual info influenced my experience here, but when the George Floyd protests were happening and everybody was watching stuff like Do the Right Thing, it was crazy how its timelessness made it feel so immediate and relevant despite coming out 30 years prior. Whereas Night Country feels very much stuck in a time and place, despite how recent that time and place was. Notice how the hero cops agree that cops are bad so we don't have to work to like or empathize with them? We're hitting plot beats that 13 Reasons Why was hitting four years ago. Maybe what it boils down to is that this season is only interested in the cleanest, most convenient kind of complexity, dancing around what's really an already status quo conclusion. The persecuted Anupiat are monolithically good and sagely until their act of vengeance that makes up the show's pivotal reveal. The white characters are unanimously averse to Anupiat tradition and only show solidarity in performance, not praxis. And these political groups only exist as groups with no individual people with conflicting personalities and ideologies and lived-in lives making them up, be it the activists, or the miners, or the factory workers. There are attempts at making the characters' lives messy, but never do they actually betray these hard political lines and break out of their archetypical cliches. I needed Dean Cain to show up and twist everyone's brain into a pretzel. This lack of complexity or specificity carries into the interpersonal character drama. Not that interpersonal drama is mutually exclusive from politics, quite the opposite, especially in something as explicitly politically charged as this, but on every level, our characters are absolved of any hard decision making. After being betrayed by her girlfriend, Leah just cuts her off and that's that. No hard reckoning, no confrontation, no attempt to grapple with the things that make it hard to cut someone you thought you loved out of your life. Granted, it was a pretty extreme situation that could maybe justify the extreme response, but this show has a knack for writing situations that justify our characters not confronting the complicated emotions it's already spent so much time setting up. For instance, we spend the whole season and watching young Pryor reckon with the fact that his dad is a monster. The culmination of five hours puts him in this position where he has to choose between his dad and his found mentor, and then right as the crucible is closing up, Hank makes the decision for him by starting to shoot Danvers, and turning his death into a matter of protection and self-defense. This is one of my biggest cop drama pet peeves, a sort of pre-absolution that makes it so our characters never have to dip their toes into morally gray terrain. Night Country tries to pretend it's shown us a hard moral decision decision by making Pryor hide the body, but morally he knows he's done the right thing, and he's only hiding the body because of the corrupt police infrastructure, which if anything only vindicates him further. And sure, he feels guilty because it's his dad, but like, what else was he supposed to do? The end reveal offers a scenario to comment on vigilante justice and guilt by association gone too far, but pre-absolves the factory workers by showing us unambiguously that every scientist partook in killing Annie Kay, and thus equally deserved punishment. I've 
I've really tried to get out of the habit of using this word in criticism, but a lot of this just strikes me as lazy. A prime example would be the character Rose, who in a mid-season reveal apparently had a whole past life as a professor and intellectual. Not once does she mention what she taught, or what she wrote about in her supposedly many academic papers. From afar it resembles dimension, but when you look closely, it reveals that there's no substance there. Like noticing the fingers on an AI-generated image, or, I don't know, the fake rock band on an AI-generated poster. Lopez actually addressed the AI posters, but her explanation has the same air of retroactive justification that comes with every show or movie that gets caught using AI. I'm sure you could come up with a similar explanation for Rose's backstory. Oh, she doesn't go into specifics because she's so over that life and doesn't care about it anymore. But why put your energy into coming up with reasons for things not to be specific when you can instead put it into making them specific, and coming up with character details, I don't know. It probably sounds like I'm nitpicking at this point, but I bring all this up to demonstrate that there's no real follow-through on any of the complicated themes or emotions Lopez has spoken so much about in press material, and that makes it hard to pinpoint what the actual takeaway is meant to be here. The only things left to fall back on are the thematic interests that have always accompanied True Detective, and that leads us to the paradox that is trying to conceptualize this season as its own thing, are a piece of this broader body of work. By like the second or third episode, the show had already gained notoriety for its callbacks to season one and various structural elements and easter eggs scattered about, seeming to have learned all the wrong lessons from Fargo. And this is where it falls into the American Psycho 2 trap. It's been documented that Lopez wrote and pitched Night Country as its own unrelated miniseries, and HBO offered to fold it into True Detective as they were having issues with Pizzolatto. So they announced Lopez as to write and direct the new season. I think this is pretty evident in the actual material, so presumably that writing process was just a series of edits to tie Night Country into the True Detective universe. It's understandable that people scrutinize this season against its predecessors, particularly season one. Not only are recurring elements mentioned, and start asking the right fucking questions. Not asking the right questions. Not asking the right questions. But in many ways, the form of the narrative bends to match that of the first season, as though the structure of True Detective is some sort of monomyth. Lopez drops us into the language of long car conversations, doling out character philosophies. There's a scenario where we watch the detectives kill suspects in a flashback while listening to them tell a cover story in the present where they didn't murder anyone. We get an attempt at dual timelines, kind of, and a direct callback to the time as a flat circle monologue. Except where Rust Cole and Marty Hart talk about the cosmos and human nature in their long car talks, Danvers and Navarro talk about Tinder, where season one more or less brushes past the unreliable narration of killing suspects to show how casual this sort of thing is in police operations, the matter-of-factness of it speaking louder than direct confrontation, Night Country builds its entire case around this act, and Danvers admitting it to Pryor is something of an emotional climax to the story, which ironically makes it less powerful. Where season one has a proper dual timeline, Night Country finds itself in a weird limbo where the only two ways to look at it are as having a totally wimpy dual timeline or as having excessive flashbacks. The latter of which I think is probably the more accurate way to look at it. And as for time as a flat circle, the callback here is probably the most shameless, unearned moment in the whole series. Like American Psycho 2, a lot of these aspects are severely exacerbated by this sort of one-to-one -one scrutiny. I'm not saying it's great or particularly revealing or insightful dialogue, but the Tinder car conversation feels like a lot more of a misfire when you think of it as trying to recreate Rust and Marty's conversations, and a lot less of one when you think of it in a vacuum, as just regular TV dialogue. Again, still not great, Lopez struggles with verbal finesse and nuance, but not a direct betrayal, per se. I also found myself frustrated with Danvers and Navarro's foil, often being characterized with the same aggressive, emotionally inaccessible devices as each other, but a lot of this frustration came from applying the exact Rust-Marty dynamic, and when I tried not doing that, I found myself more apathetic than actively frustrated. And as for the time as a flat circle thing, I've got no defense for that one. But this isn't quite the same as American Psycho. For starters, I'm sure there still would have been a viewership for this star-studded HBO show without the true detective name, though maybe it was only able to snag this cast and be greenlit by HBO by using the true detective name. 
So, is. in either case, that's still distinctly different from the development of AP2. Lopez was also clearly striving to make a resonant work of art and not just a commercial product, so I can't exactly apply the, oh, they were trying to make a piece of garbage line of thinking here. And American Psycho 2 has basically one scene tying it to the original, plus some voiceover, and is otherwise completely divorced as a movie. Whereas Lopez has been very vocal about the relationship between Night Country and Season 1. Not just thinking of these aspects as tie-ins and easter eggs or whatever, but conceiving of the very fabric of this season as a mirror image to the first season. So I would say it improves the season to divorce any actual true detectivisms from it, but doing so opens up a series of complications. Removing a core intent from a work in order to enjoy it feels slightly like not how art works. And if anything, I'm sure Lopez would take offense to the notion that this show is only good when you remove one of her biggest aspirations from it. There's death of the artist, but it's hard to really kill the artist when the intertextuality she's harping on is so baked into the content of the work. Plus, even if she were never commissioned to do True Detective, if HBO had just taken her Night Country pitch at face value and ran it, there would still be an undeniable True Detective influence there, without any excuse to be like, oh, well, if you don't think about it as True Detective. That first season still is so influential, you could slap a True Detective prefix onto half the shit that's coming out right now. True Detective, Mayor of Easttown. In fact, let's compare Night Country to Mayor of Easttown real quick. HBO miniseries about a middle-aged alcoholic woman detective who's trying to move on from an unsolved case while dealing with her lesbian daughter's messy relationship, and a younger male partner on the Force whose relationship with her evokes a sense of cradle robbing. Oh, and a dead son. Maybe I'm giving Mare of Easttown a little too much credit for some of these tropes, but the true detective to Mare of Easttown to Night Country back to true detective dynamic is rare levels of snake eating its own tail. Maybe time is a flat circle after all. But after all that, and maybe it's because of the saturation of true detective cribbing that's still going on, I still struggle to conceive of Night Country as an actual season of True Detective. Most of the connections are really quite arbitrary. The Tuttles could be any corporation, the Travis Cole lore doesn't add anything to either season, the spiral amounts to a completely empty payoff. They don't enrich, they mostly just exacerbate what's already a mediocre season of TV. So yes, TLDR. All this defense and qualification is to say that Night Country is not completely horrible. It's just not very good. With Lopez now being commissioned to tackle season 5 instead of handing it over to another voice, we may be watching the very identity of this show be overtaken and eclipsed. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about anyone's behavior here, and I don't exactly condone Pizzolatto fueling the fire, but I'm definitely sympathetic to watching your baby get taken away from you and raised into adulthood by someone else. And I'm even immune to the season 2 reappraisal that's been going on, and think season 1 was mostly lightning in a bottle. But it's just very transparent how much HBO views the True Detective name as a commodity for built-in viewership rather than a specific expression. And I'm afraid all it's gonna do for Lopez, who isn't exactly agency-free in all this, but whom I don't blame for pouncing on the opportunity, is either bring more uncharitable engagement toward her work, or just run the show into the ground. Wish I had a more optimistic note to leave on here, but uh, hey, you can't win them all. As always, links are in the description. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Shit, maybe even hit the notification bell if you're feeling crazy tonight. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.